This is a production of Cornell University. So thanks everybody uh, for our live audience. Uh, I got a poll up there. Do you measure growth on green? So uh, if you get a chance, um, fill that out. Episode five, uh, happy to have Bill Kreuzer of University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, came through Cornell a couple of years ago. Um, so happy to have him back on our Cornell Turf show here. Um, we'll get to Bill in just a second. We're talking about growth rate, um, but we'll start uh, with some cute images here from Frank. Uh, I'm sure you always pull these off uh, somewhere on social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay attention to them. Thanks, Carl. Good morning, everyone. And, and big thanks to Bill for joining us. And for those of you that are live, uh, happy to have you here watching, uh, happy to have you watching and listening on the podcast, of course, happy to have you there as well. And we continue to see lots of pictures with uh, people in our in, in the golf business uh, bringing uh, their kids to work. Uh, and, you know, they're just uh, they're just too cute to pass up as a as a father. And and speaking as a father and a, a pal of this guy, John Carlone and I big shout out to John and Leslie. Uh, sending their second boy into the service. Um, uh, just a uh, picture showed up on Twitter. Just want to shout out to my longtime pal and to Leslie for raising uh, two fine men willing to go off to uh, serve us. And, and so we really appreciate that. And Carl, I'm going to turn it back to you uh, for your BMP minute, because I think it's pretty timely with maybe some of the dry weather that's going to be coming. Yeah, so last week you talked about a little Frank. Um, there's there's some areas of drought up here in the Northeast, uh, you know, Cape Cod area, uh, Eastern New England, um, and I know we don't think about it in March, but you know, starting up the irrigation systems is uh, quickly approaching. And uh, just a, a really simple BMP tip, uh, and we we have it up as a par on here, right? Something everybody should do: uh, just check your sprinkler heads early in the year when you fire up the system. Uh, just visually checking them, right? And then that means going out. Um, you know, the, the very simple version of this is just go out and watch every head turn. Um, so we have a good version. We got Scott over here who's already uh, getting underway, checking his irrigation. Um, if you got a drone, you know, drones are great for pretty pictures, but they can be put to functional use, throw them up in the air. If you got a bunch of irrigation heads on the fairways, uh, just take some video and, and check, make sure those are all rotating. Uh, the right speed, the right throw, and, and then the best case scenario. Um, you can do the catch cup, the standard catch cup audit, uh, make sure your, your coverage good, but um, also the moisture meters. If, if you've got the GPS function on a moisture meter, that's a really good tool to do an irrigation audit, maybe a little bit easier than the catch cups. And also uh, you, you get to see how the moisture gets into the soil. And that's the thing that really, matter, that really matters, right? It can land one place and, and kind of trickle to another. So uh, that's our good, better, best uh, BMP tip of the day. Yeah. And I just want to say, Carl, you know, back to the poster and the hard work here, getting this done, uh, drawing it to the simple things like just, you know, look and make sure and they're spinning and working right, checking your nozzles, uh, simple stuff to get started right um, uh, moving forward. So listen, let's talk a little bit about the weather. Um, we're starting to see the season progress now, starting to get a above normal to the southern part of the region, South Jersey, Philly, Delmarva, and even uh, up along the Great Lakes. You see Buffalo, Rochester, Batavia, uh, really uh, a week or two ahead of normal, uh, way up there. So, so obviously the warm winter where the water doesn't cold, get as cold uh, moderates that temperature and of course uh, may, may be leading to uh, some of the warmth that they're seeing. Now, uh, it appears from what we heard from R.D. Gaetano this morning in our conference call and, and what our weather can, uh, seems to be looking at moving forward, uh, the predictions uh, for the next 8 to 14 days uh, are not only going to be warm, but Art commented to us this morning that he's never seen a so profoundly dry continental United States prediction. Uh, he's got this uh, uh, sort of idea that this is something that we don't see very often and, and certainly something to pay attention to. And as Carl indicated, uh, particularly for certain parts of the Northeast, uh, early signs of drought. And he commented directly on uh, groundwater levels. And, and, and we heard from some of our extension uh, agents throughout the state and the region that stream levels are, are a little bit low. And it's not good when we, when we start off like this 
uh, with projected uh, dryness coming forward. Now, uh, Ian Daniels uh, did a wonderful job of, of uh, Carl, this is a good use of that drone, brother. You know, very easy to make uh, the claim, hey, you know, this is why we have to treat. <laughs> this is what it looks like when we treat. Uh, it's And snow mold is such a classic way uh, to see these differences. And particularly this year with COVID, um, uh, the, you know, whereas we're moving out and, and people are, are taking up golf and droves and our, and our play is, is so much increased, uh, having this good early spring playing condition, you know, right down the middle, right down the middle, you know, you're not spraying out to the tree line, you know, right down the middle, right around the bunkers and, and present this to the public. And I'm sure they'll be willing to, to pay for that. Now, just a reminder uh, this is a picture from Eric Watkins' research plots at Minnesota that he's participating in the Scan Green Turfgrass Variety Trial that's run through the Scandinavian Turfgrass and Environmental Research Fund uh, based in the Nordic and Scandinavian countries. Uh, this is some uh, fescue mixed into the uh, mixes here. It, they're trying fescue greens and fairways uh, in this trial, and you can see having some inherent resistance is also a way to continue to minimize it. Now, it's not to say the fescues are going to be an answer, but uh, understanding even in, in Minnesota where snow mold pressure can be pretty high, uh, the resistance of some of these species can be pretty good. All right, let's get into the, I'm going to try to do the best I can to, to set up uh, my longtime friend here, Bill Kreiser, who uh, on, on a question that's lingering in my mind, and it begins with, with uh, soil temperature, uh, where you can see just down in the Philly area, again, in the Delmarva, you're creeping into the 50s. Uh, the rest of us are pretty much standard into the 40s. Of course, you get up into the North Country and the higher elevations, you're, you're still maybe in the low 40s and high 30s. Now, <clears throat> we pay attention to soil temperature, as we talked about last week with Rich. Um, you know, a lot for our early season fungicide applications in the golf business, whether they're the greens, tees, or fairways we're paying attention to soil temperatures in the 55, 60 degree range for fairy ring and 65 degree range uh, for summer patch. And so there's a whole, uh, you know, in, the, in, the, um, in this particular publication, the Chemical Turf Grass Disease Control publication that uh, indicates all the products and their efficacies, you see there's uh, the proverbial laundry list uh, of products that you can use uh, that have various levels of uh, e efficacy uh, against summer patch. So I'm uh, going to leave it at that. And then we'll move on to seed head suppression. And we're starting to see already uh, the early spring applications for proxy are actually ideal through much of the center part of the Northeast. Um, you're you're uh, maybe marginal a little bit to the South and still a little early up North, but a lot of people using proxy have moved to a fall application. So you've got a a spring, a fall application and a spring application of seed head stuff. And Bill's uh, done a wonderful job, uh, you know, in many of his publications and certainly with Greenkeeper that we'll talk about in just giving you the general idea of when you make some of these uh, applications of not just uh, uh, growth regulators, but you see the spring broadleaf herbicide timer. And we know some of those products have some growth regulating effects. So then we look at the early spring uh, applications of pre-emergent herbicides. Maybe you're putting your pre's down on your fairways. Maybe you're down in the New Jersey, Long Island, metropolitan New York, southeastern New England, where you know you're having to put uh, pre's on greens, uh, crabgrass and goosegrass control uh, on putting greens. And as you can see from the GDD tracker, you, you're looking pretty good for these pre-emergence timers, even though uh, crabgrass germination is quite a ways off. The timer is indicating you can get this product down. And then Bill, of course, has uh, listed in, in a Goftam article about how we apply growth regulators and the relative suppression we get from starting our growth regulation and the interval involved there. Uh, and I'll even set you up one more time, Bill, and say, you've, you know, you've, you've put a theoretical idea out there about you know stacking of this regulation over time. This was some of your early thinking uh, a number of years ago, and so up. Oh, so my question, uh, Bill, is is really simple. 
Um, I just went through uh, the use of seed heads, uh, growth regulators for seed head suppression, uh, probably a fair amount of DMI fungicides uh, for summer patch and root pathogen control. Uh, I might be putting some pre-emergent herbicides down, uh, and I might even be starting my traditional PGR program. Uh, <laughs> how much uh, should I worry about all this, pal? Yeah, hey guys. Um... I think that's a good question um, because it's something that uh, I've been dealing with um, for the last bit of time now. I mean, we're, we're, we're building these growth suppression models for different products. And three things that I've ex uh, directly studied are how proxy impacts growth rate, how DMI fungicides impact growth rate, and how uh, these growth regulators that are your A's and your B's, your Primo's, Trimit's and News, Cutlass, and all the different combinations impact growth rate. And I think that's the thing that we are moving towards is getting off of this, thinking about products individually. We need to think about them as a whole, as a collective sum. And so my latest research is taking a lot of the modeling data that we have and then grouping it together to understand what levels of suppression we're getting from all of those different products in combination. And it can be really substantial. Uh, where you're, this time of year, you know, you might see 10, 15% suppression out of proxy. You mix that with a Primo or a new, you might easily see 20, 25% suppression. Add it with a trim it, some people do for even more control. They can get 35, 40% out of that. And then you start adding in a DMI fungicide. You know, I had some pink snow mold popping up, some like a Dokium patch, it's been cool and wet. And so it's easy to think, well, I got a bunch of DMI, throw that in the tank, I'm getting another between you know zero to 20%, depending on the active ingredient you, you pick. So you start adding those all together, you might be having 50, 60% uh, suppression. So some of the new models we do starts to add all those together and then it gives a, it makes an adjustment and then it tells you what we expect for the total suppression. To okay. Look. So, but a lot of your work, and this is why I'm bringing this up. This is why you're here in the spring brother is because a lot of this work and a lot of that reference that you say to percent suppression is assuming, you know, active growth. You know, look out the windows if you're here in the Northeast and listening on a podcast or watching a video and driving, God forbid, the grass is not growing dramatically. We're at 20, 30% growth potential, Bill. Mm -hmm. Does this thing, this is what worries me is, it, it, you know, we, we put this together based on, on, you know, these products. And then there's the fact we're already not growing at full potential. How much does that add to your concern? It adds a ton. And that's why, you know, at our par three golf course last week, we applied proxy alone. You know, it's common to do proxy with a class A growth regulator. Uh, I don't like doing that until I start getting my clipping volumes where I want them to be. And so we started tracking clippings for the first time. We mowed on Sunday I mowed this morning, just got out and freezing still. Uh, and my clipping volume was high, but we hadn't mowed for four days. So when you normalize over four days, you realize my clipping volume is still lower than I would normally expect in the summer. So I'm not going to put that Primo or a new in the tank with that proxy until then. If I'm going to go spray for snow mold, I'm not going to go grab a DMI. I might go grab a different product that has less regulated properly. These are some of the maybe the newer DMIs that, that are also seem to be a little easier on the growth suppression side because I want that grass to green up. And you know the grass that is green right now? It's the poa, you know, not the bent grass. So if I'm telling people, you know, I want to grow bent grass greens and I don't want poa, the last thing I want to do is do things to make the bent grass even slower to green up. So let the grass start growing. Don't be over mowing. Don't be wanting to fertilize right now. Don't be nuking them with growth regulators. That's going to keep that bent grass from growing. Um, the fertilizer is going to stimulate more POA and the aggressive cultivation is just going to also give the POA an advantage. Let's try to manage the bent grass and let that bent grass wake up before I start beating it up with cultivation, growth regulators and nuking it with fertilizer. Yeah, it'll help the bent grass it's green up, but it's really going to give the advantage to the poa. Well, and there you go, because we got a lot of poa greens up here in the Northeast, right? Yeah. We, we, because of the traffic, um, that's really good for, really appreciate you segregating it out by species, because it's certainly uh, going to matter. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about that relative to poa, because I am worried about 
uh, summer patch on POA. Uh, I do like to have my seed head suppressed because it just makes for a better uh, playing surface. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I normally use Proxy and Primo, so that's good to know. And I guess the answer to my question is simply, it's a good idea to start collecting clippings and monitoring growth right out of the gate. And I'm wondering how long this is going to happen because some people say, okay, Frank, I haven't applied yet. And that's why I'm, I wanted to do this early because I know probably nobody's applied too much stuff yet. I want them thinking about it before they're doing it. How long are some of these regulations lasting, Bill, in the springtime, regardless of the species? Yeah, so if, you know, at Green's Height on POA, um, if you're looking at a, an application of something even like a new, and um, you're looking at 25 days of suppression out of it, and that's assuming an average temperature of about 50. So that's highs of 60, lows in the 40s. I'd say that's pretty standard type spring weather. You're going to get 20 days out of Primo, 25 days out of a new, nearly a month out of your application of trimming. And remember, rate isn't important. So if you think I'm going to use a lower rate, so I, I need to apply sooner. Nope, you're just going to get less suppression, but it's going to last the same amount of time. Uh, we've been showing this now for 12 years. It's not like it's a two year little fluke thing here. It's 12 years of data that shows that rate doesn't really change duration. It only changes the amount of suppression. So if you are worried about these things and you want some suppression, go out with the lower rates. If you're worried about that flash from an early DMI or the risk of a frost that can occasionally bring that discoloration, use the lower rates, um, you know, the bottom end of the labels for the growth regulators to not get too much suppression, but get onto a PGR program. So if we're looking like temperatures in, in Nebraska are finally gonna get up into the, uh, the 70s next week. The growth rates are still starting to increase. And I, I'm probably going to have to do a Primo proxy app end of next week. And I'll probably do actually a new in proxy this year. Um, and just I'm going to do that combination and, and that will start adding my growth regulator. But I'll use a lower rate of a new until my clipping yields get to where I would need to use a full or a higher rate. So I'm always flexible with those rates to try to hit my clipping yield goals, which for me are somewhere between one and, and about 1.5 quarts per thousand square feet, which is equivalent to 1.1.5 liters per hundred square meters. So don't freak out about those units. Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> yeah. All right. So listen, let me ask you about the seed head thing in particular, see if you got any data there. Uh, the fall proxy apps that, you know, Sean Askew's pioneered over the last several years. Um, do we think that uh, slows us down out of the gate? Um, I don't know if I've seen it slow the green up from the proxy. I definitely see the DMI fungicides with snow mold definitely slow us up out of the gate. That's why I'm really an opponent to people wanting to use class B PGRs at their snow mold applications in addition to their snow mold active ingredients. I know that was a trend a couple of years ago, and I've just seen a lot of damage, especially in this part of the country with really slow green up. And again, a lot of the bent in the bluegrasses are the ones that are slower to green up. The POA still kind of grow, seems to green up the same. So that whole thought process of keeping the POA less competitive, that seems to be backfiring. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen any issues with proxy applications in the fall in terms of negative. I've only seen a ton of positives and that's really great seed head control because uh, we have looked at it here. I know we had a paper out that Zach Riker had been working on with researchers from I think like 10 or 12 different universities that have all shown the benefits of those fall proxy apps. So I do proxy with snow mold and then I do proxy by itself. And then I do proxy with whatever class A PGR I have on the shelf uh, for my second and third applications. How much does N rate get involved here? You know, guys are trying to goose it to get it going, um, especially if your POE is going. Uh, you know, you're probably going to feed it a little bit with something. How much uh, can nitrogen, I know, you know, your classic slide with the, the three petals. Uh, again, you know, we don't have a high growth potential, but at the same time, you do see some response to N uh, applied early. What are your thoughts on, on trying to kickstart it or, or maybe a pigment to draw temp? Uh, colors to it what are your thoughts yeah on, so this is the reason i get, on, get hard on this on the spring end is um 
we did a bunch of research in a growth chamber um, for three years, but we had like six different cultivars or species of grass. And then we talk about growth potential. To me, growth potential is how well that plant can make sugar. So when you're at peak, that means the plant is really efficient at making sugar. But there's a disconnect between making sugar and responding to fertilizer. So what we did in our study was put down different, the same level of fertilizer at different temperatures and see what the clipping yield response was. So like your annual bluegrass and your ryegrass, its peak fertilizer response is in the, the low to mid 60s for an average air temperature. The bent grass is mid to upper 70s. So that's where, yeah, if you put fertilizer down now, that bank, that POA is going to respond way more favorably than the bent grass is. Again, that's why I don't like doing it too much because it just gives the advantage to the other species. I want to let that bent grass be responding. So after 60 degrees, now the POA response to fertilizer starts going down and the bent grass response is going up. So I'm trying to balance that ecology view here of let's try to manage the bent grass when it wants to grow. And if I'm doing anything really early because I'm really excited and I think, oh, I need to get some growth, the POA is going to thrive on it because it is ready to grow to try to make seed and, you know, do its winter annual life cycle. Well, and the bent grass doesn't. Yeah. And, and, you know, POA accommodates a lot of spring golf up here in the Northeast. And yep. because we don't have the, well, have historically not had the intense heat and dry conditions that turn it into an, a real, a real winter annual in your neck of the woods, uh, because we don't have that. You know, what I'm trying to balance here is, you know, I see guys getting themselves in trouble early with their POA greens, maybe because they are starving them more and they're not paying attention to the impact of the regulation. And then furthermore, for those who want bank grass, it is important to say, put a lock on the damn fertilizer shed because you're simply not going to get a response. That's that's what you're saying, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, and so I get some pressure from, you know, people at the parks and the course that we take care of. Oh, we need some fur on those greens. It's like, no, we don't want, we've, we've been eliminating POA with, with sand and cultivation and all those things. But if you are maintaining POA, so we used to have POA fairways. And so, you know, then we would make sure that we're, we're watching our growth rates. And I would definitely stay on those proxy applications because the plant is so much healthier in the summer if it doesn't go to seed. We had uh, one of the first years we did that, stu that study, we put her in the first fairway because we had great POA there. Well, of course, then the rest of the fairway pukes out except for the center of the fairway where we put down the proxy and we had these like perfect green squares for the whole summer right in the middle of number one fairway, the most visible fairway on the golf course. Right. Um, because we were able to really make that plant healthier by aborting that, that futile seed head production uh, growth phase. So even in Nebraska, we can grow some good POA here. It, uh, it struggles in the middle of the summer, obviously, just like, you know, within the Northeast, maybe a little bit harder for us than, than it does for you guys because it's just so darn hot. Um, but it still can linger enough to be a nuisance. And if you got POA fairways, you got to be on those proxy apps to, to keep that plant healthy if you're trying to manage towards that or poor greens. That's right. All right. So listen, I got another question, but Carl, are there any questions from the audience uh, uh, coming in that we could tackle here? Because I got a couple of more things to work through with Bill or we take some questions. Yeah, we, we got a good one from Blake. So uh, Blake has been, um, he actually has a test plot. Uh, so he throws down his uh, sheet of plywood there and when he's applying proxy. So in the past, he said that plot um, that didn't receive proxy, about a week after he applies, he gets anthracnose on the whole green um, from what he thinks is drought stress, except for that little plot that didn't receive proxy. So his question, Bill, is um, has he ever, have you ever seen proxy affect soil moisture? Uh, my question might be, is that anthracnose related to some uh, suppression of growth? Uh, any, any comments on that? Yeah, I haven't actually measured that, but the way, you know, what proxy is a stress hormone, ethophon, which normally, ethylene, which is normally not that important for uh, grasses. It's not like it is for like flowers that, you know, completely just start dying under any low level of ethylene, but it does still trigger this kind of stress response. And so I don't, I'm could be speculating here, but I can totally understand how maybe the presence of ethylene is changing a lot of the physiology beyond just stopping seed heads. And if you're seeing that, I'm not saying that you're not, 
And the great that it's great that you have a check plot so that you could actually mm -hmm. notice it. I mean, that's how you really notice that type, make that observation. So um, I think that there's some rationale for why that could happen. Um, so if you think it's a moisture side, just, you know, being a little bit more aware that your moisture levels might be changing based on your own experiences at your facility uh, to try to minimize any anthracnose that may be associated with that moisture issue. Uh, and there's absolutely no question, Blake, that based on the Rutgers research, and I've heard this from Buckley a hundred times, uh, any time, even the minimal drought stress uh, at the wrong time for annual bluegrass is, you know, can be can be enormously uh, problematic in, in my sense. And I think, was this higher cut turf? Uh, were we talking fairways, Carl, or what was Blake uh, talking about? Was it higher cut turf, or do you know? Uh, I believe it's greens. Um, greens, okay. Blake, if you've got a, uh, he says greens, yep. Greens, yep. okay. All right, good. All right, I was wondering about whether it was in the short grass. All right, listen, Bill, let me ask you, because it's a speculation at this point, as we wrap up here, just a few minutes left, where we do have a lot of golf courses that'll use dimension on their greens that might use a uh, Scott's goose and crabgrass control on their greens. Um, what can you speculate or what do you know or what have you poked around about looking at the contribution that pre-emergent herbicides might have knowing that they're cell division inhibitors and growth regulators in some ways in their own right? Yeah, I don't have a ton of information on that, Frank. I think it just depends. Are we seeing that cell division happening, inhibition happening only at the root or is it also having any kind of impact on leaf? The leaves and so most of growth occurs from cell elongation the, the, the elongating of cells a bit and increasing of their size but if those cells aren't dividing then they can't elongate right so it's going to shut down both processes so um i think you you might have a contribution there i have seen some issues with dimension being applied um here in nebraska and then we've had some real issues with uh Newer bent grass uh, stolons not pegging very well with the with the roots into the Root. soil and it kind of pulls up. Um, but that was just a couple occasions. It wasn't replicated research. Yeah. Uh, I know though for even me at our par three golf course, we got a lot of goose and crabgrass in our putting greens. This is goose and crabgrass central in this part of the world, and uh, and looking for options there is something that I'm constantly trying to figure out myself too. I think Sean Askew might have had some some research with that um, that I saw on Twitter a couple of years ago. That I might have to dig up. I don't know if you remember any of that, Frank, and what he was using to help with goose grass control in, in greens. But uh, I'm not really sure on the growth regulator side because it's just a niche that really hasn't been studied that well uh, in my lab. Yeah, he's been looking at, uh, I think he's been looking at Pilex um, for goose grass control uh, in the early phase. Um, and I think, uh, let me just uh, color it in. And you're right, Bill. Most of what we know about pre-emergent herbicides that we know forever is that they seem to be primarily impacting rooting. Yeah. Uh, you get you get clubbing, right? You get that that pronounced clubbing. They just become these clubs instead of you know fibers. Um, and of course, uh, over time, uh, actually, plants can live like that with that root clubbing for a little while because the roots function. But if you get obviously young plants or plants trying to peg in, like the bent grass you described, that can be problematic. Now, listen, Bill. I don't want to open up this can of worms, but I'm probably gonna. I'll tell you right now, we're gonna have you back either for here or in the sports turf world, because I want to talk about some of the stuff we talked last year during the early days of the pandemic and you guys have been doing with the impact of these growth regulators on ryegrass fairways, on Kentucky bluegrass uh, sports fields, and some of these other grasses that people have on tees uh, and fairways that, that we're trying to regulate, but it's a, it's a different animal based on the PGR. Can I, can I get, can I get you on the record saying you'll come back and yak with us in between cutting greens? Oh, did we lose Bill? Oh, we might've lost Bill we right before I was him. about, I was just about to plug his uh, green keeper app too. So uh, for everybody still, uh, still listening. Bill um, and some other folks, Doug sold out, have created a website that tracks all these models. We saw some data earlier, growing degree days. Um, it's really hard to track that all yourself if you're making an Excel file, file or whatever. Mm -hmm. Bill's Greenkeeper app has all these models in there, the latest version. So 
Uh, I'm going to put that in the, the chat feed or down in the YouTube description for everybody. Good. Um, we hit the nail right on the head, Frank, 30 minutes. There you go, Carl. Uh, always a fun conversation, growth early in the year. Uh, gets me hopeful to get out there and play some golf. Um, so uh, uh, again, thanks everybody. Episode five of the Cornell Turf Show in the books. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks very much, everybody. See you, Carl. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.